No one wants war, but here's the problem. Um, the U.S. is facing an existential threat. It's a national security issue, in my opinion. If there's a sudden move towards uh, replacing the U.S. dollar, meaning perhaps a BRICS announcement of a new currency with gold and all that, I think then it would react quite violently. The world hasn't woken up yet. Uh, if you look at the price of steel, who do you think controls the price of steel? China. Okay, China produces a billion ton of steel a year. It decides they are the marginal buyer of steel. Well, what's happening today is the marginal buyer of gold is no longer in the U.S., it's no longer in Europe, it's in China. If you look at just China and the BRICS Plus, and you put all their gold holdings together, plus what I think is undisclosed, I think that there will be a moment in time when if it is a BRICS initiative, if that's where it ends up going, that they'll be able to say, we now set the price on gold. For the last 40 years, our politicians, both at the federal and the provincial level, couldn't care less about the mining industry. Frank says we're in, we could lose the race. We've already lost the race. Is Canada failing its resource sector, economy, and citizens? Kitco News Insights Interactive presents the Mining Titans Power Panel with Frank Justra and Pierre Lassant, hosted by Michelle McCory. Brought to you by Eagle Plains Resources. Mineral exploration, revenue generation, and corporate incubation, all in one. Hello, I'm Michelle McCory. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Kitco Insights Interactive Mining Titans Power Panel brought to you by Eagle Plains Resources. Two of Canada's most successful businessmen, billionaires, living legends in the mining sector, are warning that Canada is jeopardizing its place on the world stage as it fails its resource sector, economy, and citizens at a pivotal time in history. As geopolitical battle lines for critical minerals are being drawn, Frank Justra, CEO of the Fiora Group, and Pierre Lassant, Chairman Emeritus at Franco Nevada, are both sounding the alarm that Canada is headed down a perilous path with potential irreversible consequences. And they're both here today to explain why this underinvestment in Canada's lifeline, its resource sector, is so dangerous to the country, the economy, and its citizens and also to weigh in on other ways that Canada may be failing its people. And given that they're both mining moguls, we will of course get their thoughts on gold hitting a new record high, their forecasts for the precious metals, as well as their outlook on the mining sector, gold's role in the bifurcation of the global monetary system, their outlook on the macro economy, and the top geopolitical threats of 2024, and more, including questions from our viewers. So let's introduce our power panel, and joining us from Vancouver is Frank Justra, mining and media mogul and global philanthropist. Frank is the CEO of the Fiori Group, managing a diverse portfolio of assets, including investments in natural resources, entertainment, art, food, and lifestyle. Over the last 30 years, Frank was at the helm of several resource investment banks, including Yorkton Securities and Endeavor Financial. He was also the founder of Endeavor Mining and Wheaton Precious Metals. Now, beyond this, Frank founded Lionsgate Entertainment, one of the world's largest independent film companies, which has produced hits like Hunger Games, John Wick, and Twilight. And Frank is also recognized for his global philanthropic activities, including his own Juicer Foundation. He's also the co-chair of the International Crisis Group and a recipient of the Order of Canada. Frank, great to have you back with us. Michelle, it's always my pleasure. And joining us from sunny Palm Beach is Pierre Lassonde, a legendary mining industry innovator, essentially the man responsible for creating the mining royalty model. Pierre Lassonde is the co-founder and chairman emeritus of Franco Nevada, the first publicly traded gold royalty company. Pierre has also served as president of Newmont Mining and as chairman of the World Gold Council. He's also a recipient of the Order of Canada and was promoted to Grand Officer in 2022. Pierre has donated millions to the University of Toronto, making him the top contributor to mineral, mining, and engineering education in Canadian university history. 
And Pierre has been in the mining industry for well over 50 years and has been inducted into the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame and the American National Mining Hall of Fame. Pierre, very nice to have you back with us. Great to have you both back on Kitco. Well, thank you for having us. All right, and I know, Pierre, we have you for a limited time. So we're going to direct most of our initial questions to you. And then Frank's going to have to take over because uh, we know we have a hard out with you due to some scheduling issues. And we do have a lot to discuss, as I just mentioned, including gold hitting a new all-time high, which you both correctly forecast. Last time we spoke, we will get to that. But I want to start off by focusing on an issue that uh, you've highlighted because you have tremendous concerns over and you've teamed up to make a point that Canada's resource sector is facing severe underinvestment at a time when securing critical metals and minerals for the energy transition has become a matter of national security. You wrote an op-ed in the Globe and Mail and you point out that Canada's pension funds, which represent $2.7 trillion of Canadian savings, have more invested in China than they do in Canada. All right, so Frank, why don't we start off with you very quickly breaking down this issue for us? Well, when you consider that uh, the world is in a um, race to secure critical minerals for the energy transition, well, we don't even know where that supply will come from. There's all sorts of forecasts uh, about supply deficits in the major critical minerals in the next 15, 20 years. And uh, Canada being endowed as one of the most uh, prolific mineral countries on the planet, second largest landmass in the world, uh, largely unexplored, and that there is almost zero investment uh, in the Canadian mineral sector, uh, it, it's, it's, it's worrisome. And I think we're, Canada is in danger of losing out in this race for critical minerals. And, you know, something would be great for our economy. And there's such low investment, not just from the pension funds, from by, by institutions in general. And it's something that needs to be corrected because, as we all know, it takes a long time to find, develop, and put a mineral property into production, you know, anywhere between 10 and 20 years. So it's, it's, it, it's urgent that we address this issue now. Right. Uh, Pierre, in, in the, the op-ed that you both co-wrote, you guys made the point that geopolitical tensions around resources are front and center these days, uh, with China, for example, restricting graphite exports, Canada declaring it could ban Chinese investment in critical minerals. And you say that the era of national resource, resource nationalism is rearing its ugly head and the bat lines are being drawn. Elaborate on that for us, Pierre? What do you mean by that? Well, I'll pick up where uh, Frank uh, left it in a sense, because when you look at the mineral sector in Canada, it's been totally ignored by government for the last 40 years. It's not just like yesterday. It goes back, like for the last 40 years, uh, our politicians, both at the federal and the provincial level, couldn't care less about the mining industry. And I think that the, the current crop of politicians are finally waking up to the fact that uh, critical mineral is going to be a real issue. But, you know, I will say, like, you know, Frank says we're in, we could lose the race. We've already lost the race. Okay, let's face it. China controls anywhere from 50 to 90% of the production of all critical mineral, including lithium, you just name them. They, you know, like China controls, like, the, all of that. So we're trying to catch up. That's what we're trying to do. And you know, we can get, I get phone calls from Ottawa, you know, like, uh, what can we do to create like a, a policy? Well, first of all, a mineral policy. If we have no miners, if you have no mines, if you can't permit any mines, you're not going to get a critical mineral policy. You won't do any good whatsoever. So it's not just, you know, creating a mineral policy. It's really started to look at, you know, uh, like Chile, uh, there was a press release a couple of days ago that Chile wants to cut by two thirds the time it takes to permit. You would think that in Canada, where it can take up to 12 years, that they would have that on their agenda, like number one. No, they're increasing the length of time. Um, and then you speak to the amount of money that, you know, we, uh, that the industry needs. Well, 
you go back to the pension fund. The pension fund, as you pointed out, is over $3 trillion of money. And essentially, 72% of that money is invested outside of Canada. And what's in Canada, two-thirds of that is in bonds. It doesn't do anything. And all, less than 3% of that money is in Canadian public equities. So our pension fund, are com I've completely left Canada. And if you want to look at comparable, the, the best uh, uh, comparable would be Australia, where it's the opposite. They have $3.5 trillion in Australia of superannuation fund, which is the equivalent. Well, 72% of that money is invested in Australia. And over 22% of that money is in their public Australian equities. And guess what? Their performance is no different than the performance of our Canadian fund. So our Canadian pension fund. So even though our Canadian pension fund are, you know, the, the 18 former CEO wrote, like we are the model in the world and everything else. Well, they may be the model, but they're not the model for Canada. Okay. Because they, this is Canadian pension money that's going, you know, two thirds of it over to 70 5% of it is going outside Canada, creating jobs that compete against Canadian and is not there to provide for the Canadian in the future, particularly when it comes to national resources. Well, Pierre, I'm going to stick with you. Um, firstly, you mentioned the issue of government and regulation, and we'll get to that, how the government could be just much more accommodating and friendly to the mining sector instead of what you say is, is hostile. But let's focus on this pension fund idea, because that was a big focus of this op-ed. And as you just pointed out, Canadian funds have less than 3% of their total assets invested in Canadian public companies. But this is down from 28% back in 2000. So why have we seen this big decline over the past 24 years? What do you think is behind this pullback? Oh, I think that uh, the, 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 um, the pension fund management of the uh, they're all taking religion from Goldman Sachs and they think that they're running a U.S. pension fund. And they completely ignore the fact that uh, when you take two uh, trillion dollars of money outside of Canada that's not in, you know, invested in Canada, you make Canada poorer. Because who invests in Canada? Well, if we don't have the confidence to invest in our own country, who will? But they don't see it that way. They see, well, we're managing a pension fund just like we are at Goldman Sachs. Well, you're not Goldman Sachs, okay? You are a creation of the Canadian government. And the only people who can rectify the situations are the politicians at the end of the day. Because these funds were all created by politicians, but they never put any governance around them. And so... Believe me, these people, they would rather fly to Hong Kong, to Beijing, to Sydney, Australia, than go to, you know, Thunder Bay or Sault Ste. Marie or Shizugamo, okay? And that's what they should be doing, but no, okay? And uh, that's why so much of the money is gone. Uh, Pierre, one last question to you before we move back on to Frank. Just to counter that point, you could argue that the funds are investing in what they think will deliver the best returns for their investors, and they don't think it's Canadian companies. That You could argue that they're upholding their mandate to their investors. What, what do you say to that, Pierre? BS, okay? <laughs> when you look, when, I mean, it, it, when you look at the facts, okay, when you look at the Canadian market over the last 5, 10, 20 years, it has done just as well as, you know, uh, the Australian market. And if the Australian pension fund can put 22% of their money in Australia, which is an economy that is like two thirds of Canada and have, you know, just as good, great return for sure, you can do the same thing in Canada. Um, but as I said, it's a lot more fun to get on the plane and travel all over the world and think that you're the best. And, but you ignore the reality that we have to invest in Canada. Well, let's focus on that reality and the consequences. And Frank, I know you have been a big proponent of highlighting the importance of securing resources for national security, especially at a time when, as I say, you wrote that resource nationalism is rearing its ugly head and the bat lines are being drawn. What are the consequences 
of this underinvestment for Canada's economy and for Canadian citizens? Well, I think it's it's uh, when you underinvest in a country, you're gonna your your uh, per capita GDP is going to drop, and that's exactly what's happened in in Canada over the last thirty years. It's gone from ninety five percent of the U.S. Uh, down to seventy two percent of what it is in the U.S. Um, so uh, it is just it it just makes sense, right? You if you don't invest in in your own future, you're you you know everything's gonna everything's gonna drop in value. Uh, and it becomes almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. But, you know, just um, going back to what Pierre was saying, it, it, it's not just the Aussie funds that the Canadian pension fund that perform just as well as the Canadian pension funds. On average, most Canada has done better on average than most emerging market and developing companies in terms of, in terms of our market performance in, in, in the public markets. Um, and, uh, you know, and why the pension funds left in the first place, because they found it more convenient, not just to invest in China, but they found it easier to invest in index funds, which don't require any management at all, in private equity, which uh, doesn't allow for price discovery because it's a very opaque system and you only get price discovery when you try and liquidate a position. And it's invested in long-term government bonds, which is a guaranteed losing proposition in pure and inflationary environments such as we are today. So um, what we're advocating is for part of the solution, and it's not the entire solution, but part of the solution is you can still invest in Canada and get the same kind of returns. You have to refocus, close certain types of trades, like the China boom years are over. I mean, it's still going to continue to grow and do well, but the boom years are clearly over. Their markets are plummeting and their real estate's imploding. So from the pension fund's point of view, you should start looking at what is the future, and the future is critical minerals, which is going to be in very short supply, meaning that the value of those critical minerals are going to have to go up in price. And we're richly endowed with that. So we should, the pension funds should start, should start allocating some of their money, it doesn't have to be all of it, but it's some of, at least a little bit more of their money into the Canadian mineral sector. But what happens if they don't, Frank, in terms of the access to these resources? I mean, paint me the picture of what okay, this well, looks well, like well, if, if we well, carry well, on well, down this path. Yeah, well, if you carry on, so uh, the China's, even America is partnering with Saudi Arabia to to uh, exploit mineral development in different countries, and mostly in Africa. Um, and I just think we're going to lose out. They're going to find their minerals elsewhere, Latin America and Africa and uh, Asia and other places. And Canada is just going to be left out in the cold. And it was just, it's a huge missed opportunity. Not only for Canada, the Canada's economy, but also for the world at large, Pierre, considering that Canada does have all of these resources. So what would you like to see changed? You don't want these guys, you know, traveling off to exotic destinations. You want them to be focused on Canada. What kind of government intervention, Pierre, are you hoping for then? What do you want to see happen? Uh, clearly, the uh, government should uh, look at the the incentive that you know. I, I think it was Charlie Munger who used to say, "Show me the incentive, and I'll show you the outcome." And in the case of the the pension fund, uh, one of the problem that they have is then they remark every month to supposedly to market. Well, one of the they hate uh, being in public uh, stock because they have to if they have a bad year. None of them make their bonuses, and they like to pay, get their paycheck. They like to get their bonuses. So what do they do? Instead of like Australia that has only about 3% in private equity, our funds are closely to like 30 or 32% private equity, which is nuts because you can't measure that. If that sector goes sideways, you know, they're going to jeopardize the entire pension fund of Canada. It's way, way too much. And again, it was a wrong incentive. So I think that you have to look at, you know, the whole incentive. And to my mind, the way to, to, to do it at this point in time, I would just be very uh, prescri prescriptive. I'd say you, over the next 10 years, you got to be back up to 75% of money stays in Canada. Only 25% goes outside. And in Canada, you can put that money wherever you want. Uh, but a minimum of 20% has to be in Canadian pub, uh, pro, uh, public equities. I'd be very prescriptive at this point in time. 
until you can find a financial incentive that would create the same the same incentive. In Australia, right. for example, the, what the government has done is they have framed dividend, which is once the company has paid the tax on the dividend, the person who receives it doesn't pay another tax like we do in Canada. So the pension fund can distribute the dividend tax free to their um, their the, the people the superannuation. And that's a, a, a huge incentive for them to invest in Australian public equities because it's the only place where you can get a framed dividend. So you could look at all kinds of financial incentive to create uh, the incentive to uh, stay in Canada. But if they can't get to that point, I'd be very prescriptive. All right. So you want very aggressive government intervention here. Frank, do you agree? Is that what you think should happen? No, I, I agree. I agree. And uh, again, it, uh, it, I'm not sure exactly how it would work, but it, that's not the end of the problem. There, there, there are three problems with uh, the Canadian landscape with respect to the exploitation of critical minerals. There's the funding issue, which we've just addressed, both not just by pension funds, but by institutions in general in this country. Um, there's the permitting problem, which uh, Pierre referred to. I mean, Listen, I've, as you know, I've done a lot of business in Latin America and in Africa. I've barely touched Canadian mining in my 40 years of being in this business because, and for very good reason, the permitting here is very uncertain. It can take 10 to 15 years to get a permit for a mine here in Africa and Latin American countries. We can do it in 18 to 24 months. So we're very uncompetitive. Why would investors put money into a into an investment when there's so much uncertainty in such a long period of time before they can realize cash flow. And the other problem is the lack of infrastructure. A lot of our mineral wealth is largely unexplored in very remote areas. We're going to need infrastructure. We're going to need access roads to the Ring of Fire in Ontario. We're going to need ports and roads up towards Nunavut. We're going to need hydroelectric power plants in the Yukon. Uh, we have to consider all sorts of things to create that infrastructure, maybe in partnering with First Nations on power projects, but you have to build that infrastructure or else it's extremely expensive to explore and develop and mine um, uh, minerals in, in, in these remote areas. So it's those three things that government can certainly help to address. Low interest loans, you know, additional flow through incentives for very remote areas. I mean, I can list and list a number of common sense initiatives that the Canadian government should do. But it, this kind of action requires bold and visionary leadership. And I don't think we have that right now in this country. And that, that's going to be a problem. So it's not just the investment side. It's all these other things that need to be addressed in a comprehensive approach with a strategic plan to be able to compete at a global level. So, Pierre... Our viewers could say, all right, you guys are in the mining industry. Obviously, you have incentive, speaking of the word incentive that you used earlier, to promote this, to want pensions to allocate more money to miners, to make regulation uh, less challenging, to make it easier to open mines. By failing to do this, how does this actually impact the average Canadian citizen? Well, I, Frank uh, touched on it. It's the fact that uh, our purchasing power keeps going down because we're producing less and less per capita vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States. And we're becoming, you know, essentially slowly but surely, um, you know, like a second world country instead of a first world country. And, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago, as Frank said, we were like our GDP per capita was 95% that of the U.S., and look at it today, we're 72%. Mm -hmm. Why do you think our dollar is trading at 73 cents to the U.S. dollar instead of parity? And it's probably going to 60 the way things are. You need bold leadership to change that and create the incentive to you know, uh, invest in Canada, uh, increase our productivity, and invest in you know, the industry of the future. Um, that's really what we're talking about here. So, Pierre, have you had any traction since you've started making people aware of this, pushing for more government intervention, calling for bold leadership? Have you seen any results since you and Frank have been very vocal about this issue? 
Well, we, uh, they, Letco Barroso published a uh, letter that was signed by over 90 executives from all uh, different industries in Canada. They appeared in the Globe and Mail and uh, incredibly supportive of uh, what, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're supporting here. And uh, so, yes, uh, I think the politicians, have, uh, are the, we, we have their ears. Um, they don't know how to react to it. But they, they, I think some of them have asked their finance department, let me know, well, what can we do? Um, they, uh, they, uh, it's something that uh, they're trying to deal with. But have we got the ears of the politicians? Yes. Have we got the ears of, like, you know, the, the, the industry? 100%. They, they can see it as clear as we can. All right. Well, hopefully they get the message, especially as you guys have been very vocal and pushing for that. And on that front, I want to bring in a quick viewer question. As I said, this is an interactive session. And because you guys have been relatively vocal, uh, Pierre D, actually, uh, at uh, one, has a question for you, Pierre. And he says, ask them why they aren't getting even more involved in politics. How about that, Pierre? Any interest in being more in the forefront of the, the political situation in Canada? Uh, look, I am very happy to support progressive politicians uh, that, you know, are the leaders who want to change the country, who really want to uh, create wealth in this country. And uh, but uh, I'm not a politician, so I don't kiss babies. I'm not very good at that. <laughs> it, it, it takes a special kind of person to do that. Okay, yeah. um, not me. So, but yes, from the background, very involved. He doesn't like to kiss babies. <laughs> what about you, Frank? I love kissing babies, but not <laughs> other people's babies. Just mine. Um, so no, I, I agree. I, I I don't think. Listen, I'm I, I I promised myself a long time ago I would never go into politics. I, I think as Pierre says, you have to be a very special type of personality to want to be in politics. But I think what we need is just common sense politicians. We got to we got to we we need politicians and leaders that think these things through. And when you think of like, th I'll give you an example. Think of the irony of us banning China from our critical minerals investments in this country, while at the same time, our pension funds have more invested in China than they do in Canada. Does that make sense? It doesn't. There's no, it, there, there's a lot, there's a disconnect between what politicians are doing and what is needed to be done. And it's just, to me, it's, and that's why I think you don't get, you know, really smart and capable businessmen never go into politics because they look at it and go, you know, it's just it's it's a it's a terrible business to be in when you have common sense guiding you. Pierre, I'm going to put you on the spot. Is there any particular political candidate that you think does have the vision to take Canada to where it needs to go? Well, now you're asking a very pointed question. All I would say is that uh, the, the the current government certainly is not has not been supportive at all of the industry. And I think that's probably at this point our biggest problem. I mean, the world, for example, is crying for LNG. Uh, we have, I think, the second largest LNG reserve in the world. And what are we doing? Nothing. Okay. When, you know, we could have the, uh, the, the, the pipelines, we could have uh, the LNG facilities and creating real wealth for, Can for Canadians. Okay. Uh, and no, we're not supportive. We're trying to sell them, you know, like uh, bubbles. We're trying to sell them blue sky. Where we're going to sell you, you know, like hydrogen. Well, we don't even know how to make hydrogen. We have no hydrogen plant, okay? Like we have no capacity to make it. So be realistic. And, uh, you know, like the, the federal government is giving billions and billions for a company to come and create a battery factory. Well, all the materials comes from China. Uh, the intellectual properties come from Sweden. And uh, what are we doing here? We, yeah, we are creating jobs, but we are we increasing the value to Canadian of this investment? Not as much as we should, because we should be using Canadian minerals and we should be using Canadian IP, intellectual properties. 
So this is where, like what Frank was saying, you you need, you know, a crop of politician who can put it all together and have a vision that's consistent from, you know, like the, literally from the ground up. Right. I know we are going to run short of time and there's a big issue that you two disagree on that I want to touch because I know you agree on most things and we'll let Frank then carry on that discussion, seeing as I know you guys are in consensus on most of the other topics. But I know that as we're having this conversation, it comes at a time where we're seeing gold reach an all-time high, although there's been a disconnect between the price of gold and the miners, as well as outflows from gold ETFs. And some of the thinking behind that is that it's all linked to some of frustration with fiat currencies and the debasement and devaluation of the US dollar. Now, Pierre, you're shaking your head. So why no, don't you no, tell no. us what what's behind that? You know what? Um, I, I think the, the, the world hasn't woken up yet. Uh, if you look at the price of steel, who do you think controls the price of steel? China. Okay. China um, produces a billion ton of steel a year. It decides they are the marginal buyer of steel. Well, what's happening today is the marginal buyer of gold is no longer in the U.S. It's no longer in Europe. It's in China. Between the Central Bank of China and the Chinese public, over fit, over almost 60, over two thirds of all the annual production is taken up by China. They are the new marginal buyer. They're, that's where the gold price is set. And when you look at the ETFs that have been bleeding gold for the past year and a half while the gold price keeps going up, why? Well, because the gold price is not set in the U.S. anymore. It's not set in London anymore. It's set in, in, in Shanghai on the Shanghai Gold Exchange and in China. And this is part of the reason why we have such a big disconnect between the gold equities and the gold price because one is set in China, the other one is set here. And people here are like still asking why gold is above $1,700. Okay. They, their mind is not there yet. Um, and there's a whole crowd that's fixated on crypto and not fixated on gold at all. And that's another big disconnect that we are seeing. So that's the, I think, part of the reality that we're seeing today. All right, I, I want to get on the dollar before we let you go. But Frank, what is your thoughts on why we're seeing gold hit these new highs? Retail demand is down if we look at ETF outflows, uh, at least in North America. But as Pierre just pointed out, central banks are buying up gold. 2022 record year for gold purchases. 2023 just missed that by about 45 tons. And according to the World Gold Council, that trend is continuing into 2024. And yet the miners are not catching up, they're underperforming at large. Why the disconnect, Frank? Well, well, first of all, before I answer that, just on Pierre's point, and I think he's right, the days where gold is consumed in the East, but price in the West are coming to an end. That's So China is now setting the price of gold. And when you look at, uh, for the first time just recently, gold is still is rallying in the face of hawkish Fed comments, in the face of a relatively strong dollar, and and um, and um, and um, and strong economic uh, data coming out of the U.S. Normally, gold gets pummeled when you get that kind of activity in news. So I think there's definitely a decoupling of um, Western influence on the gold price. So that's number one. As to the miners and and the gold price, this is the greatest disparity I've seen in my entire career. And I was mentioning to Pierre just before this call, only today did it start to change. And you're starting to see the gold stocks moving up with the gold price. And I think, as I've said all along, and I've been saying this for a few years now, quite a few years, say gold stocks will start to perform only when we get to a new high on gold that surpassed the old high. And the market is relatively convinced that it's going to stay at that level or go higher. And that's just beginning to happen. So I believe, and Pierre may disagree with me, but I believe that the sentiment will come back. And um, it may be slowly, maybe a stealth rally at first. And then eventually, FOMO will kick in because market players, especially in today's environment, 
are momentum players. If they see something with movement, they get on board. And this market has been completely flat and dead for so long that it gets no interest from, 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 from the type of investors that exist today. All right, Pierre, I know we're running out of time with you, so I'm going to let you give us uh, your final thoughts here, including on what Frank said, but also on a note that you touched on earlier. And then Frank's going to have to debate this without you as to why you don't think that the U.S. dollar is in any imminent danger. No, unfortunately, the U.S. dollar is uh, Tina. There is no alternative. And when you look at where to park your money, okay, uh, the uh, all the other currencies, including the, the euro, the yen, uh, the yuan, you know, forget it. It's a controlled currency. There's just not the size of market, the freedom, uh, the uh, you know, the the laws that goes that that you know goes in the back of the dollar that you have. And so, while I do believe that over time, the influence of the dollar will come down, and it has come down already over the last 20 years, not by a whole lot, but it has, it will continue to, de to decrease. Um, but I think you're looking at one or two generation minimum before, you know, like you can call it a quit. So, um, I think that, uh, the relationship between gold and the dollar will be there. Gold is the anti-dollar. When the dollar is weak, gold is strong. When you look at the U.S. budget deficits for the next 10 years, like they're already at $34 trillion of debt. They're going $52 trillion. These are numbers from the Office of the Budget in the U.S. Uh, I think at some point, people are going to look at that and say, yeah, the dollar has got to come down. But it's, it's a relative game. Come down against what? Well, against the other currency, are the other currency any better managed? Well, no, when you look at the Canadian dollar, and when not you, you look at some of the other currencies. So what do you depreciate against? Gold. And that's why I am so bullish on gold at the end of the day. And with that, I'm going to have to sign off. I'm sorry about that. All right, give hey, us Pierre, a quick gold no, forecast Pierre, before I you get, jump I get, to, I, I get to talk behind your back now, and this is going to be so much fun. So watch this rebuttal. When this thing comes out, um, because I'm about to rebut you. I'll, I'll, I'll take I'll take your end, Pierre. I'll try play devil's advocate against Frank. But qu very quickly before we let you go, do you have a gold price forecast for us for the end of the year, Pierre? Twenty four hundred. Twenty four hundred gold by the end of twenty twenty four. Thank you so much, Pierre Lassant, for joining us, Frank Justra. Okay. Thank you so Thank much, you. as always. Thank and uh, Frank Justra, you now carry the torch. I wow. kind of know what you're going to say, but you go ahead. What do you say to what Pierre Lasson said? That, yeah. that the, to recap, he said the dollar is safe for at least two generations as the global think, reserve currency. Go I, ahead. I think that's I think that's wishful thinking. And he and I have had this conversation before about his Tina explanation. There is no alternative. Um, here's here's the problem, okay? And as he pointed out, the U.S. is on an irreversible path to perdition, okay? And and my only guess, the policymakers know this, okay? And my only guess is that every, you know, these policymakers will kick the can down the road. As long as, as, long as it's not on their watch, they're not going to worry about it. As long as they have enough nuts squirreled away, you know, uh, for themselves and their children, um, you know, they know winter is coming. Okay. They, they, they know this. So, and the U S political system is very, very broken. So no decisions can be made. So these 2 trillion plus deficits every year for as far as the eye can see are going to continue. And at some point you're going to have a U.S. dollar crisis a lot sooner than one or two generations in my opinion. Okay. And I think it's the arrogance and ignorance of policymakers and the arrogance and ignorance, which I call the original human AI, okay, that keeps thinking that American exceptionalism is going to save them from simple math, okay? So I, I honestly think that at some point at the rate that we're going, um, there is going to be a U.S. dollar crisis, okay? And, and Pierre is right. It's like when the U.S. dollar has a crisis, it's going to be against what? Well, it's going to mean inflation, and it's going to mean the dollar is going to collapse against things, you know, and it may fall against currency, some other currency somewhat, and it's definitely going to fall very sharply against gold. Um, so that is going to happen. So you've got that happening, which is the fiscal situation, at the same time that the rest of the world is finding ways to trade outside the U.S. dollar system. And every day you're seeing new and different ways by which this is going to be achieved. 
It's happening now. There are plans to create different mechanisms so that they can increase non-dollar trade in the future. But at the moment, you're getting tons and tons of bilateral trade agreements using local currencies. And then you incorporate central bank digital currencies into that mix, like the M-Bridge project that China's doing with Thailand and the UAE, which has been tested for the last couple of years. And you can eliminate the dollar completely in international trade. So you have to ask yourself, is that a two-year problem, a five-year problem, a 10-year problem? I don't know, but it's certainly not a multi-generational issue. And I think that you're going to see a much steeper decline in the use of the dollar than you've seen in the last 20, 30 years, as Pierre was pointing out. All right. Well, Frank, to your point, we are seeing this trend of de-dollarization, certainly amongst the BRICS countries, where they're encouraging trade in their own currencies and away from the dollar. And as well, the speculation of this potential BRICS common currency backed potentially by commodities, potentially by gold on a blockchain, as we're hearing Moscow allude to. Now, Frank, I will give you credit because in the conversations that I've had since my time at Kitco, you were the first to really articulate this concept of the bifurcation of the global monetary system. Now it seems pretty obvious, but you were one of the first people to really highlight the trend that people will move away from the dollar, that these other countries would form either their own currency or just trade in their own currencies, and that we'd start to see the split in the global monetary system. How far along do you think we are in terms of that split really becoming a wider chasm? Well, again, no one knows, but my guess is that, you know, China is the, is spearheading this global movement and they're finding a lot of, a lot of, a, a big audience that is very much in favor of this because a lot of the global South suffers from a high US dollar price, you know, because the US is basically exporting its inflation to low income countries. A lot of sovereign debt is priced in US dollars and the service, like, Last year alone, almost $500 billion of service payments, interest payments were made by low-income countries. And, you know, they can't afford this. So they're all uh, looking at this Chinese-led initiative, which is being led now through the BRICS mechanism, the BRICS Plus mechanism, which is now 11 members with 20 more applicants sitting in the wings. Um, already with the 11, they control... 39% of the GDP, and they have half the world's population. And so I think that as the BRICS get stronger and stronger, and there are more and more bilateral, uh, more and more of the bilateral trade is done through local currencies, and and China moves towards internationally internationalizing the yuan, which they're working very hard at with these uh, contingency reserve arrangements and currency swap agreements with many countries around the world, that this is going to happen in my guess. And I guess I'm guessing, I don't know, but in the next five years, you're going to see a profound change in the amount of dollar trade versus non-dollar trade. And it's because technology is moving very, very quickly. As I've said before, there's probably 130 countries experimenting uh, with uh, central bank digital currencies. And when you think about what that does, it makes international trade so e efficient and inexpensive. It cuts out the middleman of the Swiss system, the US dollar system, and uh, it just makes so much sense for everybody. And it's happening right in front of our eyes. But what is your outlook on this common block currency that we may see by the BRICS, I, I, potentially backed by commodities, yeah, including gold? Yeah, I, I, I think that that's down the road. And I, I think last time you and I had this conversation, you rightly pointed out that, you know, within the BRICS, there are geopolitical issues, China and India being the primary example within the BRICS that, you know, they're not exactly the best of friends. <laughs> and um, so will this happen overnight? I think it will, will eventually happen. But I think here's how I think it's going to play out. Mm -hmm. In the short to medium term, you're going to have a mishmash of weekly dominant currencies trying to replace the use of the dollar. Eventually, we will have a monetary system reset, much like we did at Bretton Woods. And that will incorporate some new currency system, which I can only speculate what that's going to look like, whether it's going to be BRICS-led or otherwise. But 
In the meantime, you're going to have a mishmash of, of, of different currencies and different ways of trading, including gold. You know, if you look at what Ghana is suggesting, you know, buying oil for gold, you know, and so all sorts of mechanisms will be used and I can list them all for you. I mean, everybody's trying something different, but eventually we're going to move towards a new monetary system. And that may be a BRICS currency backed by something. I don't think commodities work as a backing their, you know, Commodities are just too difficult to 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 manage and calculate. Gold is easy because it's already part of most central bank reserves around the world and increasing, and it's a tier one asset. And uh, with the with the BIS, it's considered a tier one asset. So it's money. It's no different than other money. Only you can't print it. <laughs> so yeah, I think that that's going to eventually happen, but it may take time. So speaking of central banks, um, and we have pointed out that we've had central bank buying gold at record levels in 2022, just missed it in 2023 compared to the record set last year, and they added 39 tons to global gold reserves uh, during this year. We do have a question uh, for you, Frank, because it's very curious that the Bank of Canada has no gold, that they've sold off their gold. And we have a question from Unknown uh, 5700 saying central banks excluding Canada have been adding record amounts of gold to their reserves. Obviously, the West is aware of this, but they don't seem to be concerned given the reckless amount of government spending in Canada and U.S. One would think they understand that in doing so, they're devaluing their currencies and that having gold in their reserves would be an important step to take. Is it possible that Canada and U.S. lack this basic understanding and that other currencies and that our currencies are doomed. Are we able to correct course, or will it take a new federal government that understands basic finance to do so? That's a very loaded question. Um, well, I wrote an article on this a uh, year or two ago. It's in the Toronto Star, and it's why it was questioning why Canada doesn't have uh, central bank gold holdings. And Canada made a decision some over 20 years ago that it would sell its gold to get better returns in other types of investments. Um, which didn't work out too well because gold has been the per best performing asset the last 20 years, including the stock market, including the bond market. And so that was a huge, huge mistake. But Canada took the view that because it has a currency swap arrangement with the U.S., that it's basically part of the U.S. system. And the U.S. has its gold supplies, has the single declared largest gold holding in the world, which I can also address. I have my 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 view is that that's not may, may not be entirely true, but it is the declared the largest single position of gold in the world. So Canada takes comfort that it's really you know part of the U.S. trade system and that it it can rely on these currency swaps if it if it runs into any problems. But what it doesn't take into account is what happens if you get a U.S. dollar crisis. You know then then we go down the tube with them. So wait, just to pick up on a point that you think that uh, the U.S. is not accurately the top holder of gold in the world? No, I didn't say that. I said, no, I believe that they have their 8,200 tons. What I'm saying is that I think China has a lot more than they officially declare. And, right, and most okay. gold observers that watch the undisclosed gold purchases, not the officially disclosed gold purchases, because the World uh, Gold Council tracks the undisclosed, um, that China's probably 80% of those undisclosed, because it's all heading east. And I think they're stuffing it into different institutions outside of the central bank. And at some point, China will, if necessary, if it decides to go down that path, it will declare its true gold holdings if it has an intention of using gold in its monetary system as a convertibility, you know, as a backing or some way to use gold in back in the yuan. And that's so I think China has a lot more. And here's the more important part, and I and I can give you proof of how this works. Whoever, whichever country or collective of countries has more gold than the US can dictate the gold price, can set the gold price and manage the currencies accordingly. It's no different than what Kissinger was worried about in 1973, 1974, when he got when that Europe which collectively had more gold than the U.S., was thinking of going back to the gold standard. And they were coming up, the U.S. was coming up with ideas to either have the European countries disperse their gold to other countries so they would have less and wouldn't be able to control the monetary system, 
or to squash it through geopolitical means, which is what they ended up doing. They threatened Germany um, not to not to even think about this because they were protecting Germany against the Soviet Union in those days. So what I think is happening, if you look at just China and the BRICS plus, and you put all their gold holdings together, plus what I think is undisclosed, I think that there will be a moment in time when if it is a BRICS initiative, if that's where it ends up going, that they'll be able to say, we now set the price on gold, not the LBMA anymore, which is, we're already seeing the beginnings of that in, in, in the current trading, that China is setting the price. And when they can set the price collectively, they can say, they can get up one morning and say, okay, now we're going to back our collective new currency with gold to the tune of say 20% or 40% of our M2 money supply or M0 money supply. And that's the backing. And we can set the price of gold at some other price so that we have the ability to create more credit and more reserves, which is how the, how the monetary game is played when you use gold. So China is secretly buying gold, hoarding gold, not revealing exactly how much it has. But when it does make that revelation, Frank, is that tantamount to declaring war? Well, again, and I've said this before, and you know, no one wants war, but here's the problem. Um, the U.S. is facing an existential threat. It's a national security issue, in my opinion. If there's a sudden move towards uh, replacing the U.S. dollar, meaning perhaps a BRICS announcement of a new currency with gold and all that, I think then it would react quite violently because it would lose its global influence in the financial markets and in the geop geopolitical sense. Okay, it's going to have inflation a lot higher in the U.S. Will lead a lot higher interest rates to service its debt, and it will be a loss of it will be a lower standard of living. So to me, it's a national security issue. So I don't. I hope that the world looks at this. At, for what it is, and 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 treads very carefully as we de-dollarize. We do it very slowly, very carefully, not to create any sudden shocks that would prompt the U.S. to to have to feel that it needs to protect itself. Right. Well, geopolitical threats are very top of mind in 2024, where we have all of these geopolitical flashpoints uh, from the Middle East to potential China and Taiwan tensions to, of course, Russia and Ukraine. What do you consider to be the top geopolitical threat for 2024? That's a question for me, as well as from a number of our viewers who wrote in. For, for, for 2024, if we're just talking about 2024 and not what, beyond? Well, well if, if yeah, do I'm you gonna, expect I, some I, kind I, of... Well, you can take it to 2024 and beyond, but do you yeah. expect some kind of major development this year, especially given that it is an election year in the United States where some have made the case that it's more divisive than ever, you know, divide and conquer, that if ever you yeah. were going to take some kind of action, now would be the time to do it given the political climate in the United States. Therefore, many have put 2024 as the potential year to strike if you were going to strike. But what, what is your yeah. thought on, on a threat for 2024 and, and beyond, okay. if you want to okay. take it beyond? Well, let me, let me break it down for you. So you've got the Ukraine-Russia war, which I think is uh, turning in favor of Russia. And the obvious debate taking place in the U.S. today, why are we continuing to fund this war? And if you, you know, if it's... If, if, the, if the election results create a change, I think you're going to see a problem for the Ukraine to get funding. And I think, um, I don't know whether that's going to lead to a, a conversation about a peace settlement, but uh, hopefully it does. Um, that war should come to an end and there should be some negotiated settlement, in my opinion, um, and uh, and just stop the killing. So that's number one. And uh so it's going to be interesting to see if, if Trump gets elected and he holds to his promise about, you know, you know, <laughs> abandoning NATO and and, uh, you know, basically calling making Zelensky agree to a to to a, to a peace settlement. You know, if if that happens, you know, we'll see. Um, but uh, so I don't see any imminent danger for the world or Europe coming from there. I think it's going to be a wait and see attitude by Putin. Um, to see what happens as he continues to 
to to increase uh, you know his military capabilities in that region. Gaza, Israel, that's a that's a tough one, and that is good, that is having implications for the Biden administration in terms of losing a lot of the youth vote in and a number of swing states in the U.S. Um, it always has the problem with that part of the world that the conflict can easily blow over into other regions and get you you might end up with a direct conflict with Hezbollah, direct conflict with you know the Houthis, and a, more importantly, a direct conflict with Iran. And so that is always dangerous. And as you know, uh, the JCPOA nuclear agreement was killed by uh, President Trump. And in the meantime, uh, I'm not sure why he thought that was a smart move, because in the meantime, Iran has reached a higher enrichment of his, uh, of his uh, uranium and uh, is very close to weapons-grade uranium. And, uh, and, and I think that if, they, if Israel sees that they get you know, too close to it, to weaponizing their nuclear capabilities, they promise they're not going to let that happen. So what happens then? What, what, what are Israel's choices? Bomb Iran? What's that going to do? How is Iran going to respond? Then how does the U.S. respond to all of this? So that, to me, is the biggest powder keg in the world. That that is the the most dangerous potential outcome if things get, ever get out of control. As far as China and Taiwan, I think that you know the temperature is cool there. The U.S. has made efforts, and so has China, to you know bring down the the, the heat on on that debate about Taiwan. I think Russia's invasion of Ukraine gave China pause on thinking that it could invade Taiwan easily. Um, uh, so I think that I don't think anybody is looking for a war down there. I think the rhetoric, rhetoric will continue and the U.S. will continue to try and make policy moves to diminish China's importance in the world economy. And you're going to see that kind of competition from both sides. Um, and that's fine. That, you know, they should compete, and that that's fine. But I think I think the fears of anything geopolitical in that region right now, I think, are far off. Okay, so you're not too concerned about China, Taiwan. You don't seem that concerned about Russia, Ukraine. You think a diplomatic solution could be on the horizon there, regardless of who takes office. I think there will be a moment in time, regardless of who takes office, that. You know, common sense has kicked in. Are you just going to have a war that's going to drag on for years and years and cost billions and billions of taxpayer money when a lot of Americans are going, we don't want this? So if that if that is coming to a conclusion, you would hope that, you know, that the only other alternative is, is, is have a peace settlement, you know, and end this war. Right. Um, and you do see Iran and a potential nuclear weapon. As, as the top flesh point, the Trump administration pulled out of that Iran nuclear deal, thinking that uh, Iran was violating it in any event and that the, the measures to make sure that Iran was not violating the deal weren't strong enough and that it didn't address the issue of ballistic missiles. But whether they were or whether they, they weren't, nonetheless, I think the fact remains is that they've gotten billions of dollars from the Biden administration right now. And according to data that we know, they are even closer <laughs> to developing that nuclear weapon. And you're saying Israel has, as it's stated, is not going to let that happen. But do you think that that is in a near term sort of timeline? Do you see that happening 2024? I don't know. I don't think Iran or the U.S. want a direct confrontation. I think both sides are very clear, and, and you've seen that in their behavior with respect to the Gaza situation and with the Houthis. You know, Iran is being very careful not to take any credit for what is happening elsewhere with respect to any any moves against Israel, um, and they've tempered, they've controlled Hezbollah to you know keep keep that temperature to a minimum level of conflict. Um, so I don't think anybody wants a major war there. It's not. It's not going to do anyone any good. Um, so, but it, it, Iran is very close to weapons grade uranium, very close, and they'll make a decision based on their own calculations as to when when they're, they're going to declare 
if they're going to get to weapons grade and, and declare it and um, and incorporate that into weapons. Um, I don't know. I, I think at the end of the day, Iran doesn't want, you know, it wants to get back to trading with the Chinas and the Russias and, and, and not have this, this conflict. But, you know, it is what it is. And um, right. it, it depends if we ever get an agreement again that's similar to the JCPOA. I, I would hope we do because that will at least put, it will remove the ability of Iran to have a nuclear weapon. And you don't want Iran having a nuclear weapon. So why would you kill a deal that didn't allow them to have one? Right. Um, let's bring it back to gold because we did see gold move a little bit earlier this year on concerns of geopolitical tensions. We do have this phenomenon, as we touched on, where we have gold hitting new all-time highs, both in futures markets and in spot gold. We have outflows from gold ETFs. We have the miners not performing, although you said you think that they're starting to catch up. Um, whilst we have, you know, central banks buying up record gold, but we're also getting reports that we're seeing a lot of retail purchase of physical gold coins. Whilst we're seeing outflows from ETFs in countries like North America, we are understanding that physical gold is being purchased. What do you make of that move? It's it's beyond me. I I think um, I think. Uh, a lot of individual investors that are concerned about what they're seeing around them, both geopolitically, financially, economically, uh, are moving to gold, physical gold, as a safety measure. Um, I, I think that Wall Street has um, a dislike of gold. Let's just say that because a, a, a spike in the price of gold doesn't complement the Wall Street narrative that everything is fine and you should be investing in this and that and the other. Um, it's contrary to that narrative. They don't make any real fees off of it. So gold has never been promoted by Wall Street, and I doubt it ever will be, even though gold has outperformed stocks and bonds for the last 20 years. And even though it's outperformed every other asset class in the last 50 years, they will never talk about it. So you don't have that Wall Street push to get investors into gold ETFs or gold anything, gold mining stocks, gold nothing. They just don't even talk. You watch CNBC. I mean, it's ridiculous how they poo-poo gold while they're promoting Bitcoin and things that they can make money out of or the Wall Street can make money out of. Um, so I think that it, that that's the problem. I think that that it's, you know, the gold ETFs have not been, you know, pumped by Wall Street. They just, you know, and so that might be the disconnect. I'm not sure. But certainly individuals are concerned, and that's why they're buying the physical. I don't mm -hmm. own ETFs or gold ETFs. I think if you want to own gold, own gold. ETFs are re representative of gold that in a crisis might not actually be there if, if, if we get a real crisis. So I don't trust gold ETFs. So And that's why you're seeing all the physical gold moving from west to east because they believe in having it there in their little hands where they can see it and touch it. Because once you have it in your hands, there's nothing the rest of the world can do about it. Okay, they can't manipulate it. You know, it's, it, you own it. Well, you know, it's curious you say that because we've heard from Larry Fink recently. He's of course, is a CEO of the world's largest asset manager, BlackRock. And he has spoken out against increased physical gold investments. In his annual letter to his shareholder, he says that, Gold can be a good store of value, but it does not stimulate economic growth. Instead, it just sits in a safe. Uh, yeah. He said, when I visited India in November, I met policymakers who lamented their fellow citizens' fondness for gold. The commodity has underperformed the Indian stock market, nor has investing in gold helped the country's economy. So Fink argues that when someone keeps money in a bank or invests in a house, that there's a multiplier effect that leads to economic activity. And it's a very interesting time for him to be poo-pooing gold, especially physical gold, <laughs> when we know that BlackRock has been very, very, very bullish on Bitcoin, a complete about face there, considering previous statements on Bitcoin, but nonetheless, fully behind the Bitcoin spot ETF. And in fact, BlackRock's spot Bitcoin ETF has become the fastest growing ETF in history. Um, and he's obviously very, very pleasantly surprised by that. So it's an interesting dynamic with Fink praising Bitcoin, saying he's very bullish on the long-term viability. 
At the same time that we're seeing inflows into Bitcoin ETFs, outflows from gold ETFs, but not that, he's also criticizing physical gold, saying it does not stimulate economic yeah. growth. What do you say Just to that, bit, Frank? Well, what I say is a bit disingenuous of a, uh, an organization that has the largest ETFs in the world, makes a lot of money from ETFs, to say that gold doesn't create any economic activity. Does Bitcoin create economic activity? I mean, come on, it's it's just a code that it doesn't have any value. It's 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 you know it's whatever the investors wanted to think that it's worth. It 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 it. it. So I find it disingenuous, and I and I know why he's saying that because as gold starts to spike, it starts to put a nail in the narrative that everything else is okay. Gold spikes because there are problems, okay, whether they're economic, financial, geopolitical. And all of these things that are happening, there's a, you know, we have a humongous debt problem in this world, unprecedented in human history. And that debt will unravel at some point, especially with higher rates. So I can see why Larry Fink would say yeah. that, um, but he's talking his own book. And you know what? The fact is still, whether creates economic activity. Yes, it does. Gold, the gold business, the mining, the refining, the jewelry, whatever. Yeah, it creates a lot of economic activity. That's not even the point. The point is that you hold gold to protect your wealth. So if you've done that for the last 50 years or the last 20 years, you're doing really well. If you have a portion of your wealth in gold, you've beat the stock market, you beat the bond market, you beat almost everything else, okay? So that's why people own gold. And for Larry Fink to come out and say, well, that's, you know, that's, it, it's hurting cap the capital developments or capital formation. That's all BS. It's, it's, he's talking his own book because they don't make money on gold. They make money on everything else. And it, and, and gold is the canary in the coal mine that something is wrong with the system. Okay. Well, so I wouldn't listen to Larry Fink or anybody from Wall Street that I, I really wouldn't because they're wrong and they've been wrong forever. So it's interesting because last time we spoke, you did say that you thought gold was the canary in the coal mine showing weakness of fiat. And you linked that back to the idea of what you believe to be the suppression or manipulation of the gold price because it signals that all is not well in the economy. I mean, and that's a sentiment that Alan Greenspan expressed quite openly at some point saying you don't want gold to go up because it's a barometer of lack of faith in fiat. But what is your read then on, on the fact that you've said that you believe the gold price is being manipulated and suppressed? And then again, we have this interesting dichotomy of central banks buying gold, gold yeah. hitting all-time highs, but not to the level that you would think you would see it with this record central bank gold purchases, the mining stocks not catching up to it, and the ETF outflows. What's your read on what we're seeing and how it ties in to this idea that you believe that the gold price is suppressed or manipulated yeah, well, to a degree? I think you have to separate that question into, into different parts. Okay, first of all, on the gold price manipulation, which I wrote about a couple of years ago, um, I think, yeah, I think I, I believed, and I, you had that debate with, with Rick Rule and I, we had that conversation. You heard what I said about why I believe there was enough evidence, perhaps not a smoking gun, but enough evidence to demonstrate that there had been mani manipulation of the gold price because there was a motive and, and the means to do it. Um, what we're seeing today, and I commented on this uh, two weeks ago when the gold price started to spike in an uninterrupted fashion, and I said, something's different this time. And I said, all the manipulators stepped out of the way, and gold went straight up without any interruption, which is very, I've never seen that in my life, where it moves like that without interruption, without being smacked down. You, the those whoever was in the market manipulating before kind of stepped to the side and allowed this to happen. And again, I'll go back with what I said at the beginning of this interview. I believe that there's a decoupling of uh, Western influence in the gold price because so much of the physical gold is now in the East. They control the price now. And if if, if they keep buying it and they control the price, it will continue to go up. And so that's what I think is happening there. All right. Um, I want to bring in some viewer questions at this point, Frank, as we're starting to run out of time and, and wrap up here. 
An interesting question linking us to our earlier conversation. Joseph Khrushchev wants to know, what extent has Canada's mining industry been co-opted by private equity investment firms? And has an internationalist agenda affected the regulatory climate within the industry? If so, to what extent? So private equity in mining in Canada. Not a lot of it. I don't think there's a lot of it yet. I definitely see a lot of private equity investment in other parts of the world from the Apians, the Orions. And now you've got, uh, what what's Singer's company? Uh, he's just launched a $2 billion mining fund, um, Elliott Investment. So that's it. So those private equity players are, and I've met with a number of them. I, I know how they operate. They look to buy direct stakes and ownership in mines as opposed to public companies. And I, I see that happening Latin America and Africa and other places. I haven't seen a lot of that in, in Canada yet. So I'm not sure that it's a Canadian problem yet, un unless I'm missing something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, future Opportunities wants to know, would love to see what these guys are investing in. Do you publish your portfolios? I suspect you don't, but could you share? <laughs> Why would I do that? <laughs> but, but can you give future opportunity some kind of insight? I'd like to tell all Canadians about the future opportunities and exploration. Anything you're looking at in particular, obviously we know you have your own gold exploration companies, but wh why don't you share some of your thoughts there? Yeah, as you know, Michelle, I'm not, a, I haven't been very big in Greenfields exploration. That's not been my approach to creating mining companies. Mine's been with developing ore bodies that exist, putting them in production, buying mines, you know, creating creating companies in that fashion. Um, I don't like to talk my own book. Uh, it's not why I'm on this program. Um, I, the public market knows, is well aware of which ones are my mining companies, my gold mining companies. I've got two at the moment. I'm working on a third. Um, but, you know, it's... Uh, I think generally what every what investor should do is look at the value proposition of mining companies, both in gold and in critical minerals. Um, you look at some of these larger global mining companies, they're still very, very undervalued relative to the commodity prices, and that includes gold. So like, what do I own that I like? Nico like Eagle, I think that's a great company. It pays a half-decent dividend, and it's, it's got great growth. It's well-managed. Um, this is outside of the deals that I create for myself. The money, you know, if I look at just, I you know I, and I, I invested in BHP and Rio Tinto and these companies that pay great dividends and I think will continue to appreciate in value as we get more and more into this supply deficit of critical minerals. So I, I love the miners. I think there's incredible value there and some are stupidly cheap. You know, there, I, I have one company that I am a very big shareholder of that is trading at a ridiculously low price when you look at its free cash flow and enterprise value per ounce in the ground, all of these metrics, it's just dirt cheap. And I think that once the market starts to believe that the gold price is going to remain at new levels and go higher, I think you're going to see attention now start to move towards the miners where their value exists. And you, I started seeing it today for the first time. When gold went through 2200, I started to see real moves in some of these gold miners that I haven't seen in a very long time. All right. Uh, let's get some thoughts on what you see on the macro side of things. And Eric Joshua, Connecticut, says, what do you expect the Fed to do? Do you see rate cuts in the horizon? And how do you expect the S&P 500 to respond to all of this by the end of the year? Yeah, I think there are definitely rate cuts coming. We're going into an election year, um, and you've got the U.S. debt and deficit problem, which is, did you know that currently, if, fiscally speaking, between mandatory uh, Fed payments and interest rates and interest service costs, it's 74% of the U.S. budget. Those are things you can't touch. Okay, so the U.S. is in this debt trap right now, and at 5% interest, that's you can't manage it, and anybody knows that, okay? You can't manage $1 trillion a year of interest payments. So for that reason alone, I think that there's going to be rate cuts coming into the latter mid and latter part of this year. And, and what will that do? It's going to juice the market. 
you know. Now, there's already been several times where the market anticipates rate cuts happening sooner, and then it pulls back when it believes that there's going to be postponed, uh, you know. And But at the end of the day, they cannot, cannot maintain these levels of interest rates. It just, the math doesn't work. It just, they'll bankrupt the country, so they're going to have to bring those rates down. But you see the stock market then rallying when you bring those rates yeah, down. Yeah, it may rally. For, it may rally for a while, but I think that the stock market is hugely o- overvalued. But I think a big part of that is the magnificent seven, as opposed to the market in general. I think most of the market is not as overvalued as those seven stocks that have gone through the roof, and they're going to come back to earth. I mean, you know, they're great companies, but you know, these valuations are just stupid. And you know, you and I had this conversation about the market just pre-COVID, and I said at that time that, you know, the stocks were grossly overvalued and they had to come back, and, you know, and you'll get these kind of corrections. So timing short-term, you know, market activity is always a mug's game to begin with, but I, 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 so yes, the market could rally a bit, or it could anticipate a rally in advance and then come off, you know, it's hard to tell. You can't play, uh, playing short-term in the market is, is really a mug's game. What is the reaction to the price of gold when we do start to see the Fed cut rates? I think it's going to definitely go higher because right now the market is mixed whether uh, the rates are going to be cut in June or later on, how many rate cuts are going to be. So there's a mixed view and there's mixed messages coming out of Fed officials. So when it actually does happen, I think you'll get a bump in gold. But I think the gold, gold is already anticipating that there is no choice. You have to cut rates. So you think that's priced in? We had Pierre leave us with 2,400 gold as he had to jump off. What do you think is uh, your price target for, for gold by the end of 2024? Michelle, you've asked me this time and time I always again. have to try, Fred. And, and I always tell you, <laughs> only an idiot. I'm sorry, Pierre. I wouldn't say that Pierre. I love Pierre. He's not an idiot. He's right. But it is foolish to predict gold prices or any price. And I never, I've never done it and I never will. I will tell you this, gold's going higher. I've always said, I said this five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, when I first started writing about gold in 2001, all I say is going a lot higher. And I think it still has a lot of room for a lot of reasons to go a lot higher. And I think we're in the, in the third phase of that bull market that started in 2001. And, and this will be the phase where if it, it's like past markets, we'll have a parabolic move at some point. Frank, you can't uh, fault me for trying to always try to get a price forecast from you. It's what, it's what the viewers want to know. We do have another issue that's come up with some of the viewer questions. Um, I'm going to sort of summarize it and articulate it because it goes back to this background of yours in entertainment. You, of course, are the founder of Lionsgate Entertainment, so you also have your pulse very much on what's going <laughs> on outside the resource sector. And many have made the point that it's not just in the mining industry that the Trudeau administration is arguably failing Canadians, but there have been a number of very questionable laws passed that fail Canadian citizens as well, particularly with regards to media. And one of the examples is Bill C-18, which is known as the Online News Act, which in essence resulted in a news ban on Insta uh, Instagram and Facebook of news sites. Now, now to give some background here to our Canadian viewers, the Bill C-18, it's the Online News Act. It requires that tech giants pay news outlets for Canadian content. So it targets social media platforms and search engines, basically all online places where news content is often shared. And the idea was to reach a deal with these mega giants to force them to pay for content to, to create, uh, to, to allow the people publishing uh, on their, you know, platforms to get paid. But ultimately, what happened is that Meta just said that this law was fundamentally flawed, that it understands how the internet works, and it just banned all social media sites uh, from showing content from new sites. So if you're in Canada, you want to look up Kitco News on Instagram, for example, you don't get it. You want the New York Post, you want CNBC, you want BBC, local Canadian news outlets as well. You can't see their Instagram and Facebook accounts because Meta was just like, we don't want to get into this arrangement and we don't want to pay the fines. So we're just going to put a blanket ban on all of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was some reach, there was some deal reached with, with Google. So basically the net result is that Canadians 
are not getting access to other news sources via Instagram and the majority of people or a large number of people are getting their news from from Instagram and Facebook. What do you make of this particular law? I think, I listen, I, I'm not, you know, terribly familiar with the exact rule of that law, but I, I think any any law that limits access to information, to news, is just wrongheaded to begin with. I mean, I just, <laughs> it, you know, I can see why they're trying to do it. They're trying to protect their own, their own uh, you know, media content in this country. But uh, I, again, to me, it's, it's one of those things that just doesn't make common, it's not common sense. You know, these are laws, you know, and again, there's so many laws that are, you know, being talked about that really affect things like culture as opposed to real day-to-day -day economic, you know, things that are a benefit or de either benefit or detriment to Canadians. So I, I, just, I just find that the current leadership is just lacking in common sense. You know, we, we, we need some common sense here. And mm -hmm. Either they should change their ways or somebody else should get elected. Do you think you'll see a change in common sense in terms of representation in Parliament in the next election? I think, I think if you were to hold the election today, it would change. Government would change if you had held it today. Now, I, don't, I can't speak 18 months from now. 18 months is a long time in politics. So who knows? But um, um, I know that uh, the opposition is go, trying to code uh, the current government into, a, into an, a, a, an election sooner, but it, I don't think it's going to happen. Is there a candidate again? I asked Pierre this, but is there a candidate that you I, I don't do, support? I don't do can I don't do candidates. I, I you know I, I you stopped. don't do forecasts, so you don't do candidates. <laughs> no, no, you know because I I, I I don't get involved in funding politics. It's again, it's uh, you know I tried it about forty years ago, um, and it it's it, it I, I learned very quickly that being in the political game, trying to you know back this guy or that guy or this woman or that woman. It's uh, it does it's it it's not it never benefits you. If anything, it it it's a detriment to. So I stay out of politics and I try not to comment. And the only time I comment is when I, and I you you've never heard me talk about politics before in this country. I just never get involved. But I think the situation really does need. I think we need some real common sense in this country on how to run things properly. What's best for Canadians for job creation, for economic activity for the welfare of all Canadians. And I think there's too much, you know, focus on woke and cultural things that it, to me don't make any sense. Right, we hear that. I know we need to wrap up, so I'm gonna ask a final question, which is a conglomeration of a number of the viewers' questions, but you have five years to buy and hold. Gold, silver, or copper? Gold. 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 Yeah, gold. In, in, I, in I, terms of rate of appreciation, you think yeah. gold will outperform? I think so. I think because I think the, the monetary system is very fragile right now. And if it's as fragile as I believe it is, the only thing that really benefits is gold. All right. Well, Frank, we're going to let you give uh, your final what, thoughts. What, as what, what, one last thing, just because I know Pierre's going to love this, okay? So I have to say it, okay? Please represent. He, because in many debates, he and I have had this conversation. He keeps bringing up Tina. There is no alternative. <laughs> so tell Pierre that I think we're heading towards Tuna, the new, the ugly new alternative. Okay, and that's what that's where we're heading. That's my rebuttal. His Tina minus Tuna. Frank says Tuna. Pierre says Tina. Unfortunately, we did lose Pierre halfway through this, but Frank, we appreciate you carrying it through for us. Uh, always wonderful chatting with you. Thank you so much, Frank. My Justra. pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. As always, thank you all for watching, and a big thank you to our sponsors, Eagle Plains Resources. From me, Michelle McCory, and the rest of the Kitco team. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you soon. Kitco News Insights Interactive presents the Mining Titans Power Panel, brought to you by Eagle Plains Resources. Mineral exploration, revenue generation, and corporate incubation, all in one.